So I'm going to keep you here for a few minutes and give you short versions to hopefully stay interested in. Um, because I can, Dean can tell you I can go on for hours. <laughs> and so can Dean. Again, this title of Will Who Changed the World, I don't, think that's a, I don't think that's an overstatement because she changed the person that painted her, and together you, you're going you're gonna to love what they did. Um, his name is Robert Henry, and he's all over the place. He, he, he worked his tail off for 40 years and made somewhere around 2,000 pieces of art. Uh, these are all. Uh, museum holdings, there are hundreds that are in our private hands, I have no idea where they are. Um, the, you know, and so there are a few in, in big museums in the Met and in the National Gallery and the Chicago Art Institute and things like that. The single biggest collection is in here, in a little town called Cozad, Nebraska, uh, which is interesting because that's the town that, that uh, his family ran away from. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that briefly in a, in a minute. Um, all those places, if you go Google Robert Henry on the internet, you can find lots of pictures. You'll find it's precisely one image of this painting. It's from Spartanburg Art Museum, and I don't know who shot it. It's been on the website for years and years. It's the only image I've found anywhere, except in ancient magazines, of, of this painting. What that tells me is that nobody knows about it. The art, the art world has essentially forgotten about this thing, and she almost got lost in in Spartanburg. It is, however, the most important painting he ever did. It's like his Mona Lisa, but with a much better, much better story. We'll take you back a hundred years. Here's a, a comic strip. There's a, a part of a comic strip from the Sunday paper that comes out, and it's an artist, you know, Mr. Van Brush is in charge. The room is not large enough to hold all the students. I left out the panel with the other teacher who had no students, but here's the attractive young artist and all the, all the girls want to sign up for his class. And the artist very thoughtfully, the cartoonist very thoughtfully, put herself and her artist in there. Um, this, is, this is Robert Henry, you may have seen his picture before, and his, 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 his subject was Marjorie Oregon. Except neither one of them, those were not their real names. They were slightly modified with their real names. He was already famous. She was not, but she was on her way. Because she is, I think, as far as I can tell, she is the first syndicated female cartoonist. Because when she was, well, she said she was like 19, but that's not true. She was four years older. She got a job at a newspaper in the, in the illustration department before they used photographs. And that led to doing cartoons. And they were funny and they were good. And all of a sudden, four or five of them are in regular syndication around the country. Wow. Pretty cool, huh? And she's, that's the only photograph I've ever found of her as a young person. And she's, uh, Absolutely. She is just, let me go back, just, she's just, just delicious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the real name is Barbara, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we got married secretly in 1908. They both lived in Manhattan and went in uh, on a Tuesday. They took a ferry over to New Jersey and got married Tuesday afternoon in the courthouse. Why? Why <coughs> <coughs> does anybody go on a Tuesday afternoon and get married across the river? She was the, that would be my guess. <laughs> and and, I, and I'll, I'll show you why I think that. Um, but that's not the big part of the story. The big part of the story is that then when she when they get married, she changes him, he changes her. Um, and they 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 do many wonderful things together. And you can see it especially in his artwork, because before that, he was already a very well-known guy. He'd been at us for 20 years. He was, he was called a member of, of this Ashcan school. He liked to get out and paint realistic stuff. And some of it was was you know happy and, and, and sunny nature, but a lot of it was just kind of gritty, dark, urban realism stuff. Um, and that was, that was very modern for the time. He was classically trained, but this was, this was kind of the way he came to paint. Well, that, that, that changed with, with his, his little red-headed friend. Uh, it was a Christmas card from 1914. You can tell he obsesses a lot about, about her red hair. Uh, you can see, that's just his art. He, his art completely changed. Same techniques and skills, but, but just a totally different feel to it. 
Uh, he really liked women, and he really liked redheads. <laughs> there, you, can, there, you can bear us, but there, there's several in there. Um, this is actually his sister-in-law, Mar Marjorie's, uh, Marjorie's sister, uh, Violet Fifth, that he made the girl hot. Um, and the big ones are, are, are Marjorie herself. This one, uh, that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. I think that one's in either Ch Chicago or California, I can't remember. Um, but this is the interesting one. This was in a, a, a private museum in Alabama, which was actually a Ritz Carlton on a golf course, and he, he filled the clubhouse with, with artworks. I don't know where it is now because the golf course closed like 10 years ago. But do you notice anything about this painting? I think it's a eulogy. Mm -hmm. She's pregnant. She's got her head. Her belly is black, and there is blood everywhere. And it was painted about a year, year and a half after they got married. So I think he's that right. I think I think she miscarried, and uh, she sure does look doesn't look happy. Um, but other than this, most of his stuff was was very very upbeat. He loved painting women. He loved, his, he loved painting nature and children. This picture here, this is their front yard. They rented a house on this little island in Ireland. And then World War I came along, and that kind of interrupted travel and stuff. World War ends, they go back, and they buy the house that they rented. This was their house, it's still there. And it was, and most of the, the, of the island consists of poor little Irish cottages and, and shacks. This was a sad, hard place. Like much of Ireland, you know, the second half of the 19th century, something like 25% of the population either starved to death or left, and, and most of them came here, the U.S. Um, but this house was built by a, a, a land agent. He was, the, he was the rent collector for the fellow who actually owned most of the island. And the villagers hated him because they were trying to raise rents. They're starving to death. He's trying to collect money and collect, you know, chickens and, 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 and crops or whatever as his payment. Um, they refused to deliver him groceries. They refused to take him anywhere. They won't bring him heat for heating. The, the mailman refuses to deliver his mail. And eventually he leaves. And the house sits empty and the, and the, and the, and the, and the hen runs by it. But the interesting part about the story is that, that they, they, uh, the town, the village, carried out this, this economic boycott of this man because they didn't like his, his practices. His name was Charles Boycott. <laughs> and the house that Marjorie and Robert Henry bought, uh, that's where the term boycott comes from. So they would, they would, first they did it in the Southwest and then they did it in, in Ireland. Every summer they'd go travel around in the Southwest US and, uh, and painting people, mostly kids. Um, but you imagine, here comes along this, this, this couple. Here's this, you know, you know, tall, handsome, successful artist and his beautiful wife, who seems to be from New York, but she's actually from Ireland, we don't really know that. But every summer they show up and they bring, uh, they bring art, they bring a record player, and they bring money. Because every summer in this little subsistence barber <coughs> economy, they show up and when they hire kids to paint, and they gotta sit there for several hours to, for, this, for this, this portrait sitting, um, they pay them the equivalent of a working man's day's wages. Like what their dad would get to working for a whole day. So they're pretty popular in the little village. And they come every summer. And so you imagine these people who have, there's, there's a primitive education system and stuff. But they, they, people, are, they're not exposed much to the outside world. And in come this, 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 this gorgeous woman and her husband. And, and they're good to them. Um, and there, there's one, he painted, painted adults as well as account of, of him writing a letter to, to, to this, this fellow whose, whose portrait he sold in the States. And the guy's just, just you know, overcome with, with surprise and pride and beaming. And, and this thing that you can't really see here is a poster from this spring when they had, they had a, uh, Ireland put on a, 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 a multi-day conference or event about the impact of Robert Henry on Ocula. They never talk about Marjorie very much, which is, which is important. So I want to talk to you about people and, he, people and things that he changed. One of their friends was a woman named Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. She's the grand niece of the guy that built Fillmore House. 
It's also Anderson Cooper's great aunt. Um, <laughs> she also had a fling with the daughter of the architect of the old house. Names the doctor and her letters. Um, but she was in New York, and she was an artist, but they changed her because he painted her half a dozen times. They knew each other for 15 years. Um, and her husband hated this painting because she was in pants. He wouldn't let her paint it up in the house. So hubby died, and Gertrude took her vast inheritance and her husband's money and built a museum. The New York Metropolitan Museum didn't want to deal with it because she was a woman. So she said, okay, fine. She built her own museum, uh, which is a world-renowned thing now. And it's got, like I said, five, I think five paintings of her by Robert Kenway. Um, he helped a, a, there was a guy that owned a five and dime a variety store chain named Sam Walton. Oh my God. <laughs> and, 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 and he died. And his daughter, his, his children inherited a whole bunch of Walmart stock. And so the billionaire, heiress Alice Walton decided that she wanted to change Arkansas. And so she built a world-class, anybody been to a Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas? And it's her, this is her doing it. And one of her most expensive things was she bought this particular painting. It's not Marjorie, it's, a, it's an actress named, or a model and actress named, named Jessica Penn. And it's one of the, one of the show pieces. Uh, Henry wrote to a friend of his that, that Jessica had the Jessica Penn had the best body, new body of any model he'd ever seen. I, I don't know whether he told his wife that. Um, but it gives, it gives it sense, so he's got, it's got some impact. He changed a couple of artists from South Carolina. Margaret Law and Joe Cooper. These, these two young women from, well, Joe Cooper was originally from, from Charleston. Margaret Law is the first art student graduate from Wofford, and she wanted to become an artist, and she goes north. And Robert Henry and Kurt teaches her how to do better art and encourages her to be herself, which was not a particularly easy thing for, for Margaret at the time. Uh, Joe Cooper was a, a, a kind of a, a, a Cotton King's uh, daughter, and he indulged her, indulged her when she was a little girl. She, she liked to paint, and he, he got her tutors and encouraged all that. When she grew up, she said she wanted to go north, wanted to, go north to art school, and he said, uh, 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 uh. So she just waited until her dad died, and then sold her land off the inheritance, and went north. Um, so eventually they meet, they come to Spartanburg, and they're the ones that, 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 uh, that hold this, this, bring this exhibit here to try to get Spartanburg to start investing in art. Um, and then, of course, they changed, they, they changed a, a family. Here's a, um, this, this fresh produce and, and candy vendor, a young guy comes to, uh, ends up in Spartanburg from, from Greece, and Margaret and Joe Cooper, I, I don't know how this happened, whether they came to him or, or how they started talking about this, but he hosted this art exhibit that they wanted to bring. Uh, and then he put in the, the big chunk of uh, money toward buying this painting. I don't know if it was the first community thing he did, but he was once certainly to make the first big noticeable community thing. And that led to the, just this century of, of, of good deeds. I mean, all of which were undone by, by Dean Trakis. <laughs> <laughs> history and art, you know about a couple of shows that took place for 100 years ago. One was called The Eight, one was called The Army Show in 1913, I think. They were, they were in both of them. Um, and he was one of the fathers of what was called American, American realism. They changed New York. He was in all these different uh, art schools and art organizations. He belonged to, to this uh, National Academy of Design. He left it because he called it a cemetery. There's a bunch of guys with old ideas in this He left it. Uh, started up his own. The National Arts Club was two doors down from where they lived, and it, one of its members included Frederick Remington, the guy with all the Western, you know, uh, sculptures and paintings, uh, and, and Teddy Roosevelt. He also was friends with a woman named Emma Goldman, who was a, a, a sort of social activist who started something called the Ferris Center. He taught classes there. Uh, he was described as one of the, you know, one of the one of the best, if not absolutely the best, in the country for his, his, his art collection. Had all kinds of students, local students from here, famous people, 
Uh, if you've heard of you know, Man Ray, the photographer from the 20s and 30s, that was one of his students. He taught about 1,000 people, 1,000 to 1,100 people as far as we, as we know. He even taught a fellow named Leon Trotsky, who was in New York for a few months and who left in 1917 to return to Russia and became head of the Russian Red Army. Uh, it's just a bloodthirsty guy, but he found himself sitting in, in Robert Henry's art classes. I don't think he took much of Henry's concept. <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, one of Henry's students did was, yeah, okay, she took his lecture notes and, and worked with his wife and made a book out of the art sphere. That thing has been in print for a hundred years. My copy was printed three years ago, 2020, 20th edition. And it's not about how to paint, it's not about color stuff, it's about a way of thinking. And one of the most important lines is, the subject is beauty or happiness, and you can sure as hell see it. They spent two and a half decades together all over the place, and life turned out pretty well, and they looked just happy here. But they started out, he started on the run, his name was Robert Henry Kozad, and she started out in a slum in Limerick, Ireland. Surrounded by, literally, I found her address on the map, the last place she lived was surrounded by um, murderers, horse shit, orphans, soot from the railroad, and insane people. That's the last place she lived in Ireland. That's the way we are now. <laughs> Finds herself on Gramercy Park South. Holy cow, she's got one of the nicest addresses in New York and has two and a half happy decades there. I want to leave you with one final thing. Um, they changed everything, they changed art, they changed the world, they changed communities, nations, people, they changed a fruit vendor's family. This is the first known, I'm sure they're old, this is the first known painting ever. He didn't, Henry didn't do this, a guy named John Sloan did. Um, well, what, so here she is on a, on a boat with, with one of their friends. What do you notice? She's not wearing pants. She's not wearing pants. <laughs> so on trend. Who's driving the boat? She, she, oh, she is. She's yeah. still wearing the boat. And I think that kind of sums up some, because she ran most of this business affairs and organized stuff. They really were just a great couple together. Um, thanks for your time. Do you have any questions? Snapshot that thing and start building it on the other side. Thank you for that. <laughs> She's got her own world. A very amazing world. She was, absolutely. Thank you.